Welcome, Stefan. Thanks for talking with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think maybe we met back in 2014. Was it Code Mesh? Is that what they were calling it at the time? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was the, that was in London, right? London, yes. I, I was looking at Julia at the time, and it's dramatically different now. <laughs> what are some of the reasons that Julia has broken through to the level that it has? I mean, from my perspective, the, the growth has actually been pretty steady. Um, I mean, it's it's exponential. So it's sort of like every every year or so, it's like twice as many people using it. Um, presumably, that'll tail off at some point, or you know, the entire universe will be using Julia soon. You know, aside from a couple of like individual, like 1.0 was a big watershed moment. Um, you know, the commitment to we're not going to break anything for the, until we do Julia 2.0, which, you know, is not even on the horizon at this point. Um, that really got a lot of people to come on board, but mostly it's just been steady, steady growth. Uh, people sort of discovering it and realizing, hey, this solves a lot of my problems and makes my life way, way easier. You know, after a while, they managed to, to convince some of their friends to try it. And then other people are like, oh, hey, you weren't, you weren't just making this up. This thing is really great. What should a new Julia language learner know? The biggest thing is probably that if you have done a lot of object-oriented programming, uh, you know, let, let that go for a bit. It's much easier to just think about it in terms of functions applied to objects. There aren't going to be classes. They're just data types. They're pretty simple. You can, you can attach methods to them. So there is sort of object-oriented stuff in there, but it's not it's not the class-based thing that you may be familiar with from like Python or C++ or Java. Um, and, and you can come back and sort of see how you can do all of the things, but it'll be easier. It'll be an, e an easier learning curve if you're not trying to do class-based object-oriented programming from the start. That, that, that's my one big piece of advice for most newcomers. It's interesting to me. I've asked this question four times now and gotten the same answer four times. Uh, what's your favorite language feature? It's multiple dispatch. It's hard to, <laughs> it's kind of the, the big feature of the language. So for, for people who aren't familiar with what multiple dispatch is, it's, uh, this, this does relate to, you know, object oriented languages and, and, and dispatch. So, you know, when you, you if you're familiar with OOP, you, you know, you write X dot F of Y. Uh, and, you know, which specific method of F is called depends on what the type of X is. Um, and not just the static type, For even in languages that have a static type, there's a little bit of dynamic dispatch in there, even in C++ and Java, where, you know, you look at the actual runtime type of X, and that's how you pick the, the method. And that's it's a really powerful concept, and people were understandably really excited about this in, you know, the 80s and 90s when OOP really came into its own. So multiple dispatch, we didn't, we didn't invent the idea. It's been around. There's Common Lisp and Dylan, our languages that have had it for a long time. Uh, we've really doubled down on it. It is the key core concept in Julia. Basically what it means is that instead of writing x dot f of y, you write f of x comma y. Um, and then the which specific implementation of f is used depends on all of the arguments so not just x but also y um and that you know that seems like a, a really minor change but uh it ends up being pretty transformative what kind of reuse have you seen in julia and why is it different um, than other languages there's there's two aspects of code reuse that we see a lot of um so one is that it's a great language for just writing a, a really generic algorithm so, you know, you, you kind of think of a generic algorithm and you're like, well, okay, this operation, let's say it's a matrix multiply or, uh, you know, taking the, taking the cosine of something or, you know, any, any sort of thing. It doesn't have to be mathematical. It actually works just fine if, you know, the things you're talking about are databases or tables or, you know, they can be, you know, connections of some kind. And you, you write, you know, this generic piece of code and it sort of, you know, it has some concepts, but you're not entirely sure what the specific things that are going to go into it are. And then, you know, you actually pass in specific types and the way Julia works is that it looks at all of those types and looks at the oper operations you do on them and picks the most specific appropriate implementation of each of those and then generates a really, really highly optimized specialized implementation of that generic algorithm for you. 
And the crazy thing is that it just works. And I feel like people, <laughs> people are used to writing generic code and then being like, oh, but it doesn't work because this type is, you know, does something wonky or this calls the wrong method. And that's the magic of multiple dispatches. It's actually the paradigm you need to just do the right thing. Yeah, like missing plus one is missing, right? And right. and the, yeah. the minimum, you know, of a, of a zero based of, of a positive integer of zero and missing is zero. You can you can write the code to do the right thing, right? Right. Yeah, and I mean you could do that in other languages, but it ends up being, um, you know, you have to have a lot of if elses, or you have to do something awkward like double dispatch. Um, and the nice thing about multiple dispatch is it just you just kind of write the correct methods and then the right thing falls out pretty much automatically. And that's pretty magical. Pretty magical indeed. And, and um, you know, I know coming from Elixir, we have, we have protocols and a lot of languages have these features that work that way, but they're pretty sophisticated, right? And, and it takes um, a more advanced user, but with multiple dispatch, it's, it's you, you throw out another function definition and you, you leave the types off the top, you know, which is kind of heresy in other places. And you put the you put the types in in your more specific implementations, and you're done. Well, a typical approach to implementing some protocol in Julia is just well, you know, try it and see what breaks, and then keep fixing a couple things, and then you know, in five minutes, you got a thing that works. Um, with the type hierarchies, with uh, yeah. And, yeah. So you were talking um, in your talk about some of the crazy use cases that you've seen with multiple dispatch, um, mm -hmm. both from the, you know, the plug end and the socket end. One of the, one of the cooler things there is just that, you know, you, differential equations don't really fundamentally care what type of numbers you pass through them, right? So, you know, okay, so they, they should work for like float 64, float 32, and you know, all the classic ones do, even if they're written in C or C++ or Fortran or whatever. But, you know, the algorithm is basically the same if you want to do, you know, let's say big float. You really want to check your precision and you want to have like 256 or 1024 bits of precision and make sure that you're really getting the right answer. And, you know, you're not actually accidentally computing complete numerical nonsense then you kind of throw the things through the plot and it works, right? And you right. Kind of yeah, yeah. So then, the, you know, that's a sort of basic example. People have added stuff like, uh, you know, numbers that have a sense of their own measurement error um, or, you know, intervals or, you know, for example, uh, dual numbers, which is basically a way of like simultaneously computing the value and its derivative, which is surprisingly cheap. You know, all, a lot of the modern... Uh, advancements in machine learning, deep learning are due to automatic differentiation. It's this ability to like compute derivatives almost for free. Um, and that stuff just kind of flows through the entire ecosystem. And then, you know, you get these kind of mind blowing things where someone t computes a differential equation and instead of using float 64, they use these, you know, float 64 with its own sense of measurement error. And it all just carries through the library. And then you throw it into a plot and the plot also knows how to plot those. And it, you know, you just get a, a plot with measurement error bars on it, which, you know, in most languages would take me like 45 minutes just to look up how to plot the, the measurement error bars. Like, I know I'm supposed to put those on my plot because, you know, that's good science, but, you know, who knows how to do that? Um, and here you don't even have to look it up. You just, you just do it and you're like, oh, hey, that, that just worked. Amazing. <laughs> So I'm starting to get a sense, you know, I had an aha moment just in the conversation with you. So um, last year you gave this talk called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Multiple Dispatch, right? Yep. And I was going to ask you about the word unreasonable, <laughs> but you're kind of talking about um, there's some of the scenarios where you're, you're getting an unreasonable amount of software reuse. You know, I've been experiencing it for a while and uh and I've kind of, you know, I've given talks about why it happens, and I still think it's surprising and magical every time it happens. Every time someone combines these two pieces of code that were not meant to work together and they just work together, you know, I have that same sense of like, how, how does this happen? Like, you know, we we should be so lucky. 
Um, and we get that every day, which is kind of amazing. And so speaking of magic, this interview has been a great time for me. I hope that our new Grotto users can experience a little bit of that magic for themselves. Thank you so much, Stefan. Yeah, thank you very much.